delving into our third topic of the day, which is the military and the public. I'm going to read out some of the bios of the people that you're going to be listening to so you know what their background is and where they're coming from. I'm going to start at the far end. Uh, by the way, I'm Kim Dozier with uh, The Daily Beast, and I'm an analyst on CNN. And I'm not busy. Um, <laughs> that's the only editorial remark I will make today. So Rosa Brooks, at the far end, is a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, a columnist for foreign policy, and a law professor at Georgetown University. She previously worked at the Pentagon as counselor to the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. And in 2011, she was awarded the Secretary of Defense Medal for Outstanding Public Service. She also served as a senior advisor at the Department of State and a consultant for Human Rights Watch. Next to Rosa at the far end, we have Major Jim Golby. He's a National Security Affairs Advisor in the Executive Office of the Vice President. He's not busy either. either. He's an active duty officer in the United States Army and was previously an instructor of American politics, policy, and strategy at the United States Military Academy at West Point. He served as a cavalry officer, commanding a security company in combat in Iraq, and as an Army strategist. He holds a BS in American government and a PhD in political science from Stanford University, and his dissertation was titled Duty, Honor, Party, Ideology, Institutions, and the Use of Military Force, examining how domestic political institutions structure American civil-military relations. So right next to me, I have Major General James Johnson. He's the director of the Air Force Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office of the Vice Chief of Staff at the headquarters of the U.S. Air Force. The office is the service's single point of accountability and oversight for sexual assault policy matters and reports directly to the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. General Johnson entered the Air Force through the University of Puget Sound ROTC program in 1988 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. He served in operational positions supporting the U.S. Air Force from Europe to the Middle East. And prior to his current position, he served as the commander of the Air Force Recruiting Service in Randolph Air Force Base in Texas. And our last panelist right next to the general is Dr. Jason Dempsey. He's an adjunct senior military fellow at the Center for New American Security. He's written extensively on Army efforts toward gender, and gender integration, the experiences of Hispanics in the military, and our counterinsurgency efforts in Afghanistan. His book, Our Army, Soldiers, Politics, and Civil Military Relations was published by Princeton University Press. Dr. Dempsey is the co-founder of Agent Hero, a company that seeks to empower the community of veteran and military spouse real estate agents. He's also a senior advisor to the Columbia University School of Continuing Education. One thing I forgot to mention about Rosa Brooks, she's a volunteer DC cop. So. So behave. <laughs> So um, with that, you all have a varied background, but you've all been looking at this problem of civil-military relations for quite some time. I'd like to start with a lightning round, two minutes each. Um, we'll start at the far end, put the major on the spot. What's the scope of the problem? Well, thanks so much for hosting this and for your uh, introductions. Um, so I think the problem is manageable, but I think it's getting bigger, and I don't think we really understand it. I think one of the, the problems we have when we have discussions about civil-military relations as we want to fall back into neat categories of those in uniform and those not. Um, but when we, look at, uh, when we look at society, we realize that our society is pretty polarized and it's polarized all, along all sorts of different lines, on partisan and ideological lines, on educational lines, on rural urban lines. And so in some parts of the country, there's a real and significant gap and it could create some real problems for retention, recruiting, policy making and ideas. In other parts of the country, there's not much of a gap at all, and there's actually a great bit of understanding. The problem is that we don't really think about it in this way, and we want to have a one-size-fits-all approach to um, the, the problem of the civil military, civil military gap, so we need to step back and think about it. Well, you know, one thing that brought this uh, to my mind was when I was at Stanford, I talked to a class of American foreign policy students, and uh, one of the, after I talked about my two deployments to Iraq, uh, two students came up to me. The first said, Thank you so much. I, we couldn't be um, you know, more thankful and grateful for all that you did, and this was just an amazing talk, and I'm so thankful for you and your soldiers. 
The next person walked up and said, I'm so sorry that we did this to you. This was unfair of our government. Um, I, I can't believe that we asked you to do something like this. And so again, two different people heard the same talk and came away with very different impressions. And so until we get our minds around the fact that it's not just civilians in the military, and in fact it's a lot of different civilians and a lot of different military, um, we're not really gonna be able to address any challenges. Thanks, Kimberly, it's terrific to be here. Um, I, I agree uh, with Jim uh, that the problem is a different problem than we usually think it is. I think we often think that the civil military relations problem when it comes to the military and the public is uh, only less than 1% of the population serves or it's not as geographically or ideologically diverse as we might want it to be or even uh, that it correlates with a high level of civilian ignorance about what the military does. I don't really care about any of those things necessarily. Um, I actually think that the those only matter if they matter, in a sense, that you could equally say only a small percentage of the population does lots of other things. You could say the, general, the American general public is woefully ignorant of almost every major public policy issue, not just military policy issues. You pick the issue, the American public is ignorant. Uh, you could say that many, many professions skew demographically in one way or another, and we don't necessarily worry about it. You know, I think the burden is on those who want to say, hey, those matter now, to show why they matter in a different way when it comes to the military than they matter when it comes to other professions. Uh, and I think that there is a, there are some reasons that it matters differently, but they're not the ones that we usually think they are to me. And I know this is our lightning round, so I'll just throw it out there and hopefully we'll come back to it. I think that the much deeper, bigger problem is that we as a nation no longer have the faintest idea what a military is for, uh, which in turn is because we no longer know what a war is. Uh, so we don't know what we want the military to do. We're very confused about what it should do. And frankly, I don't think that that's because of civil military gaps. I think that many senior members of the US military are every bit as confused at this point as your average clueless American because the, the problems and the contradictions that are driving that uncertainty about what war is and what the military is for uh, stem from really, really deep seismic changes in the nature of the global environment. If I had to give a, a T-shirt version, I think, of the, of the current problems, I'd say that we are, we are beset by the issue of respectful indifference. Uh, and to, to match the indifference piece in that we have a public that is largely uh, disconnected from the military, started with the AVF, and then that was reinforced uh, by budget decisions, base closures, demographic trends, uh, the familial nature or increasingly familial nature of military service, as evidenced by a great report from my colleague, Amy Schaefer, uh, it's been a steady distancing from the military, and part of it's just simply uh, numbers. But then oddly, simultaneously, we've had uh, increasing and growing respect. And one of the more, most interesting findings of the recent study by uh, Corey Shockey and Jim Mattis was, even though you have overwhelming, really, overwhelming respect for the military as an institution, very few Americans actually understand it or know what it does. Uh, but they're willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. And so respectful indifference. And I think the problems that leads to is, one, uh, a disregard for what's going on, a, a palpable sense that, well, if I, I don't think we're doing well in Afghanistan, but if those guys seem fine with it, then I'll let them fight it. Uh, and there are also times when the, mil the civilian population uh, may give the military respect when that respect is not deserved because they feel that they've taken themselves out of the conversation and so just have to default to uh, thank you for your service. Thanks, thanks, Kim. I think in general, um, over the years, our, our nation's had an expectation for our military to have uh, unimpeachable integrity um, a, a um, exceptional reputation for service to uh, the Constitution in general and, and to the nation in general, and um, also that we would have unmatched expertise in the, in the various fields that our, our military has endeavors. Um, and in my specific roles, both in recruiting and in sexual assault, I found that um, by and large, the American uh, public has great respect for us. 
Um, but I think it's a, a little bit of whack-a-mole that um, all it takes is one article of, of a four-star general or um, a recruiter or something like that that creates kind of this insidious uh, uh, kind of nicking away at what we could take for granted. And um, I, I don't think it's um, at a um, watershed event uh, or at a period in time where I'm necessarily really concerned. I still, you know, I'm amazed at the amount of Americans that walk up and say thanks for your support. And I know that most of them have no idea what I do or what the military does. But I think somebody on the last panel said you, you, that you don't have to have served to appreciate your military. And that's how I feel when people literally run across the terminal to say thank you and, and want it to mean something. And when companies still do things like announce that, you know, we'll be boarding the military first, those things um, I don't think a lot of us take for granted. Um, but there are, there are some things that could uh, start to nick away at, uh, at the support for, uh, for our military. I look forward to the continued engagement. Thanks, Kim. So I'd like to kick off with a question about orders. What is an illegal order? What is an unwise order? And what do you think uh, an officer's responsibility is to stand up for what they think is right? For instance, officers, um, according to the CSIS research and the questions it posed um, on this subject, it said that officers swear an oath to the Constitution um, but not necessarily to obeying orders like NCOs do. Can you explain what is the difference? Well, so, so in our oath, our oath is to the, uh, to the Constitution and the enlisted oath is to the President of the United States and to the officers appointed over them. Um, and, and I don't know if, um, if there's necessarily a difference in terms of um, doing what's right and I think at the end of the day, that's what many of us uh, officers and enlisted are faced with. Um, and, and so for the officers, there, there is unique training that we go through throughout the course of our careers to prepare us for uh, ethical uh, considerations. And, um, and quite frankly, today our enlisted personnel are, are more educated than ever before, with many of them having bachelor's and, and, uh, and master's degrees and going through similar uh, ethical uh, sorts of training. Um, so I don't know if that gets to... Well, it, so I, I, I went down a, a very specific rabbit hole with the difference between the two, but let's, let's pull back at 20,000 foot. You know, you are a serving member of the military um, and someone suggests to you doing something like, oh, torture because it works. What is your responsibility to stand up? Do you stand up? Do you um, resign? Do you leak? And, and that's a question to everybody. Don't think y'all are gonna get away down there. I was gonna keep using the precedent set in the last panel about the respect we give general officers and just let the general here take the first <laughs> of all these. Uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question because the, when you say to swear and or uphold the sport and defend the Constitution, that's really nebulous. And for the most part, uh, officers aren't confronted with that dilemma uh, because it's very rare that you're faced with something where uh, a president or Congress is going to do something that's demonstrably against the Constitution of the United States. And so I do think the torture example was interesting because the military was largely silent as that unfolded, uh, which was somewhat worrisome, but it was also an interesting case study. You mean but back in back in back in the 2000s, 2001, yeah, whatever we're calling okay. that era. Um, yeah, the military was strangely silent, particularly given uh, how central and formative it had been to the American experience, starting with George Washington and the slave ship, or excuse me, the the prison ships off of New York. Um, so for us to, to kind of stay quiet on that was interesting. And you can probably argue one way or another, but I think officers in the military do have a deference to letting the primary branch, branches of government figure out those contentious debates that appear to have constitutional repercussions. So let me make a lawyer intervention. Uh, it's not complicated at all. Uh, if someone says to you, uh, I order you to commit torture, the answer is no, sir, I can't do that. That is an illegal order, and I have a legal obligation to <clears throat> disobey your illegal order to commit a crime under international and domestic law. The problem, and I, and I think that this is what you're alluding to, 
is that very few officials say, I order you to violate the law. Uh, they don't say, I order you to commit a war crime, I order you to commit a crime against humanity. Uh, instead, what happens is, is and now I'll, now I'll say something mean about lawyers, you get a whole bunch of people like me, only, only less well-equipped ethically to <laughs> answer these questions. For instance, lawyers in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, and you say, I don't know, do you think waterboarding is really torture? Because I'm kind of thinking it's not. And but, but they wait say, a minute. oh, goodness, you can, sir, you're you so can, right. But you can order someone to carry out um, water waterboarding and SEER training, so what's the difference between waterboarding and There's, well, I'm, there's an enormous difference, policy. needless to say, because there's a huge difference between people who volunteer to go something, through something for training purposes versus people who are coerced into doing something when they are our prisoners under our control and don't have any choice. But, so, so, so legally, I actually think, you know, the, the problem is not the ethical dilemma that arises when a commanding, when a superior officer or, or, or indeed the commander in chief says, I order you to do something illegal. That's easy. You know, the hard problem, I think, and the problem that realistically those of you in the military and will face, perhaps, if you're unlucky, is, is when, you, when you get somebody who says, don't worry, it's not illegal. You know, I got six tame lawyers to sign off on it, and you have to make a really difficult decision that is fundamentally an ethical decision, not a legal decision, of, mm, it's torture, I'm not going to do it, even though you have something from a lawyer that says it's not, or, well, you're my, you know, and, and those, I think, are ethical decisions and they're matters of conscience. Uh, you're more likely to be prosecuted for disobeying, even if it's a truly unethical order, than for obeying, unfortunately. Thanks. So um, I completely agree with Rosa on um, military officers have a duty and obligation to disobey illegal orders. Um, I think one of the things that's been more troubling in recent years is a discussion about um, the right to resign. And it's become this uh, sort of catchphrase, and almost uh, any time there's any hint of civil military disagreement, um, it's Their generals. I military officers, the media turns to, or different parts of the media, not to paint them all with one brush, um, turn to as, you know, uh, the president disagreed with the, this commander's best military advice, should this military officer resign. I think that's really damaging to trust. I think that's really harmful to the military and its professional ethic. And I think it fundamentally disobeys our constitutional oath. Every decision that deals with policy, strategy, is essentially a question of values, a question of risk. It's competing narratives about what's going to happen. And we have a constitutional process set in place to determine what those orders are going to be. And so for a military officer to then come in and say, I'm going to impose my values on the system, um, rather than and use my military rank, my position, my power to try to subvert the legitimate decisions of civilian, civilian elected officials, I think that's very damaging. But now, you've, you've decided that they're legitimate decisions just because they're the civilian elected officials. Because we have a constitution that we swear an oath to that lays out the process by which we do that. Which gets back to Dr. Dempsey's point <laughs> that what is in the Constitution and what's legal can be nebulous things depending on who's giving you the interpretation of the definition. Yeah, and I hope I'm not being painted as pro-torture because that's decidedly not <laughs> no, the point no, me neither. Uh, I was going to make. And in fact, I think that's it's very much a black mark where there was a military ethic strongly defined and accumulated over the course of 200 years uh, that we did not stand up for and educate the public on. But as per the conversation in the last panel, at what point is saying, hey, John Yu is completely off his rocker, or what point does that conversation enter that realm where a general officer is now going directly against a political appointee? Uh, you know, and I think our leaders made a decision that they would just let the noise above them uh, hopefully quiet over and meanwhile protecting everybody's individual lane. And that's a, that's a tough choice for strategic leaders. But, but, but to, to Major Golby's point, I mean, when do you, once you're above um, one star, you need Senate confirmation. And to, sorry, two star. So for one you, star, you, one star needs Senate confirmation as well. As well. And I think, uh, I think in, you know, I speak for myself here in this case. I, I think you get to this point and you realize that, uh, and somebody said before, if they, you know, they don't know a three star, didn't want to be a four star, but I think, um, once you become a general officer, um, 
you, you do understand the implications of what you say and what you do in a different way than you ever have before. And I think that, uh, I think that ethically, it's not a different standard, but I think that in general, um, you would find people that would first go through the stand up for what's right before you get down to the third or fourth echelon of what is leaking, which is I've tried everything else I can do, but somebody needs to know what's going on. But I think in general, um, we would see that as, uh, that would not be your first, first course of action. It, it's, it's to do what's right. I but, would, I mean, I would hesitate in a way to make generalizations uh, it, because I think that we can, we can all imagine creating hypothetical scenarios in which we would think that the ethical objecting military officer nonetheless obeys orders and stays in. We can also probably construct hypotheticals a la Nazi Germany where you get to a point where the only possible moral and ethical decision for a human being is to say, not only am I out of here, but I am resisting in whatever means possible. So I, I don't know that it's a particularly useful exercise to go down, except except to say that I don't think that the I don't think that there is an easy right answer to I, when do you resign? Do you re, you know? I I, I think I, it would be very very fact specific. I guess the the reason that I bring it up is the American public needs to know. Uh, the people that we send to war, if they're ordered to do something illegal or wrong, especially after the controversial history of the past 15 years where you have part of the American public thinking that what we did after 9-11 was illegal, morally wrong, and another part of the American public that thinks it was um, understandable in a time of war, um, you've got the public now saying, well, does that mean that this new generation has learned from that process, or um, will they just once again ignore what what their own inner ethics are telling them? And, th and that goes to what the public thinks about the military. It, it does to some extent, but again, to be legalistic <coughs> about it, it's not up to the American public whether or not waterboarding is a crime. That's actually <laughs> up to Congress and the courts uh, who have said at the moment that would be unlawful. Um, and even if the a large majority of the American public supports it, a military officer would be obligated to disobey in order to do something that is unlawful according to our legislation and our courts. Um, that doesn't quite capture the sort of hypothetically possible range of orders that could be given, including orders to obey a, a law that was crystal clear in its meaning, and yet we regard it as, as deeply immoral and unethical, again, you know, alluding to things like the, the Nuremberg laws and so forth. You know, you can certainly imagine situations in which the moral and ethical military officer says, I don't care if every single person in the country and every legislator and every judge said that it's okay to go kill Jews. No. Um, but 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 I I I, I don't again I, and maybe I don't mean to put you on the spot, Jim. Um, I don't know that I would be comfortable saying either absolutely, oh you have to stay in, or oh you have to resign, because it seems to me to be so utterly specific to the to the situation. And Major Gopi, could yeah, you see a place I actually in which you completely would agree with that. About two years ago, I wrote an article on this saying it was oh. time to move beyond the resignation debate yeah. for okay. the same reason. Um, so I'm not going to deny anybody their individual conscience to make a decision about what they feel they can do morally and ethically. My point is that we need to have a strong norm against it because over the past few years, it's become sort of a reflexive action that if we don't get what we want, military officers say up, you know, stand up and say, if you don't do that, we're going to resign, which I think is fundamentally problematic and reflects on us very badly to the public as well. I, I also think, um, as, as Rosa pointed out, that um, this really is a question that has to do with very contextual specifics and spending a lot of time on those and not spending a lot of time on like blocking and tackling, the things we do every day, giving advice to civilian leaders, figuring out how we should speak in public, what can we say, what we can't say. We actually don't spend enough time as a military profession thinking about those questions, and instead we spend a lot of time thinking about dissent and resignation, and it actually undermines trust in a very harmful way, I think. So another aspect of civil-military relations that the American public gets to study, gets to see splashed across the media, is the relationship between um, the top brass and the president, 
or the top brass and uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, sometimes a very contentious relationship as between President Obama and General Stan McChrystal. Um, from everyone that I've spoken to around his staff, he thought he was giving the best military advice. From everyone I've spoken to around President Obama's staff, they felt that somebody in General uh, McChrystal's camp was leaking policy to try to box him in, and that colored the military relationship from then on. So how do you bridge those divides between the president and his generals, between Capitol Hill and the generals? Well, so, so as, we, uh, as we grow up in, in the military, we have opportunities to engage uh, with our uh, leadership on the Hill. And so those are opportunities to see, to interact and to grow in, in how we interact with those uh, leaders. Um, very often, the, um, the legislative leaders as well as their staffers are, um, may not have military experience, but I think they still have a, an appreciation and a respect for what we bring to the table as a military. Um, I do think that there are a couple of things that they count on. One is a transparency and the other one is kind of a trust. And I think that that's important between the, the general officers and those that are giving guidance to the president, the administration, as well as those that are giving um, information to the Hill. And, and you, could, you could expand on that and even how we interact with the media. I think transparency and trust are important. And um, we, um, we are um, beholden to the executive branch. And so I think that, uh, that it's important that we continue to have a relationship with the executive branch that isn't riddled with uh, leaks and that, um, that we give our best military advice and that we're as transparent as can be. That is a great description of how it, I think, should be, but that's not how, that's not what we normally see. So I think this idea of best military advice is one of the worst things that's happened to the military uh, profession. Um, <clears throat> we have this idea that we can come down from on high and offer advice that is best military advice. And I think that's problematic for a couple reasons. One, military leaders often disagree, either based on service preferences, differences in, in upbringing, or um, sort of the way they see problems. So that's one problem. Two, war, as we know from Clausewitz, it's non-linear, unpredictable, there's a fog of war. So very rarely can you give advice that's going to hold up very long because our adversaries are going to react. Um, and so this, this idea that we can come and give best military advice, I think, again, pits military leaders at odds with civilian leaders in a damaging way uh, that really, I think, undermines trust because we try to say, you know, we know. It's much better for us, I think, to come to this and try to stay within our lane in terms of expertise, to try to have, have humility, to admit what we know, but also to be clearer about what we don't know or about the places where we're making assumptions or risks. And I think that last part, being clear about what we don't know and making, being clear about the assumptions is what's often lacking in our best military advice. But arguably, the American public thinks that what the military recommends should be well, portions of the American public think it should be swallowed wholesale, and other portions think no matter what they say, it's wrong. Um, and then one could say that maybe with, um, from some of the comments from President Trump, that he has given too much latitude to the military. Well, I think that one, for one, that highlights your last comment, it certainly highlights the need um, for ongoing, respectful, and quiet conversations from military commanders to civilian leaders, and sometimes, uh, they can't keep it necessarily quiet if Congress wants to hear from it. They have an obligation and duty to talk to Congress. Uh, but I think General Dempsey particularly was very assiduous about removing himself from the public spotlight and saying, I need to have the President's trust that when I walk in the room, I'm giving him my advice, knowing that he can do whatever he wants with it. I think Jim's points and the General's points uh, are one uh, to this ideal of how it should be done. Uh, I think we do a bad job of it. Um, and part of that is because the military has, in, to a large degree, uh, inculcated a bastardized version of Huntington's professional ethic that says that there's this great red line between politics and, to Jim's point, the best military advice. And, and it really is uh, very unhelpful for the way the military approaches these conversations uh, and for the military to be frustrated that, well, I just spent three months coming up with a con plan, and yet you're telling me you don't want it anymore. 
It's like, well, yeah, that's the way the world works. And so there's a little bit of give and take uh, that needs to be done. I know Rose has written quite a bit about some of this. No, the only thing I would add uh, is that the whole idea of giving your best military advice, that assumes that we know what it means to give military advice and that there is a clear, articulable distinction between what counts as military advice and what counts as some other kind of advice that, that somebody else, the civilian, should be giving. And I think actually going back to your, uh, the example that you gave when you asked the question initially, Kim, uh, of the relationship between President Obama and General McChrystal, you know, one way to look at the debate about troop levels in Afghanistan in 2009, and I'm you know, going to paint a slightly oversimplified picture here, needless to say, is that uh, President Obama uh, gets various high-level people to do a strategic review. Uh, the strategic review says, okay, here's, here, are our, here are our strategic goals in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, President Obama then says to General McChrystal, um, go off and spend whatever it was supposed to be, 60 days, and tell us what you would need to do to fully resource this strategy. And General McChrystal comes back and says, he doesn't actually say this because he gets told to lower it before he even says it. He sort of, he says something along the lines of, well, you know, we need X number of troops in Afghanistan. And the White House goes, oh, no, no, that's too many. Um, and then everybody gets into a kerfluffle about whether he's trying to box the White House in. But on some level, I think it comes down to a misunderstanding of, you know, on some level, perhaps what he should have said was, if you want a different answer, ask a different question. You know, um, he was stuck within what he saw as his lane, and he did not see his lane as saying, if you want a different answer, ask a different question. Maybe if you're not willing to pay the price of fully resourcing the strategy that you claim is your strategy, then your strategy stinks, you need another strategy, because he didn't see that as his role. Right? He thought, I, I'm just the military guy. I don't tell you what strategy to pick. I just, I just you know, just the facts, ma'am. Um, and I actually think that in some ways that the, uh, a, a probably overly rigid conception of roles sometimes fuels civil military misunderstandings uh, as much as it helps protect them. Um, you know, that, that, that then you can't have that conversation of, you know what, you have a strategy that requires integration of civil military lanes in all kinds of complicated ways. You have a strategy that may be overly ambitious and unwise in all kinds of complicated ways. If our military senior leaders don't feel that they can have those conversations, which, which requires them to get out of their, at least their sort of Huntingtonian lane, then I think we get stuck. And, and I don't know that here again, I don't think that there is a simple way to say, aha, and now here's the 21st century military lane, and it used to be over here, and now it's like this. Um, but while we're figuring it out, while we're all struggling to figure out what on earth does that mean, the only antidote is a high level of transparency, as my colleagues have said, being really clear, hey, here are my assumptions, here's why I'm saying this, you know, here's why I know you may not agree. You know, that, that, that putting everything on the table, I think, is the only antidote at the moment. Well, just to pivot, I mean, what the American public comes away from watching that is that there is a fight between the civilian leaders and the military, or uh, depending on where they come from in the political divide, oh, our civilian leaders are doing what our military wants, therefore um, they're, they're good, or et cetera. Um, so I'll just throw this out there. Mm. I, think, I think it's important to remember that even your military members, they're, they're all human. Right, and so they bring some of the same baggage that some of our civilians bring to the to this this dialogue, um, in terms of um, the sense of passion you pour into it, because the importance of the work that we do, um, lives are at risk in many cases, and um, and you maybe you come up with a plan, and that plan's not adopted. Um, you know, there may be a decision to try to influence or come up with a different outcome. And uh, that doesn't always go in the direction or using the avenues that we, you know, that we would like in an antiseptic kind of laboratory experiment. But I think it's, it's important to remember that even these officers are human. And so we'll see kind of different, uh, different uh, aspects of, uh, of who is in this uh, discussion and, and what the outcome is. Um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to pick a, a specific uh, um, exceptional case. I know we use this case with uh, President Obama and, and McChrystal, uh, and, and clearly that was, I think, one of the big takeaways was that there was this, uh, uh, even with Admiral Mullen, there were, there were a lot of issues going on in that, uh, it, during that time with Afghanistan. 
Um, so, these are people that poured their passions into it, came up with and, plans and didn't feel and, that they were heard. And I'm not saying that conflict is bad. What I'm saying is that the American public, and then sometimes the American public that becomes an elected official, doesn't understand that this conflict is part of the process. Um, and therefore assign certain value judgments to people that might make a decision that goes against the passionately put forth recommendation. So that brings us to the question of how many Americans know someone serving, much less know the intricacies of how senior military officers interact with their, our political leaders. Um, the figures are, I, the figures that I always hear are that fewer than 1% serve or around 1% serve and fewer than 5% of America know someone who serves. Um, but General, you had some slightly different figures um, from your time in recruiting. Yeah, um, we typically thought about it in terms of our tar target market. So if you look at the kind of 17 to 24 year old um, age group, we would find that um, it was, in 1995, it was about 40% uh, of that target uh, population had a parent that served. It, and that, today, the target population is again? From uh, 16, 17 to 24 years old. Okay. And uh, today it would be around 15%. So it's a significant difference. And so there are a lot of uh, households today that don't have the experience necessarily of, of military service. And so what they do get is, um, potentially what's offered in the media, where they see things like, you know, what's going on with the VA or, or maybe what's, uh, you know, uh, injured or, or uh, individuals that were killed in war. And so that's what they think about when they're thinking about whether or not their child should go off to join the military. And it goes back to that anecdote that uh, Major Golby had described where it sounded like one person, by saying thank you so much for your service, was, some soldiers have said to me, it feels like they're being patronized. Another person says, you know, why we apologize for what you're, we're putting you through, which is a way of, another way of insulting someone's service. So how do you bridge that gap between the Hollywood or the news version? The news version of the military is always going to be the bad news because that's what we do. Um, the Hollywood version is always going to be, I've seen reporters portrayed on movies. It drives me crazy. So I know it must do military folks. But at, where, where's the connective tissue to draw the communities together? So I guess um, I'll challenge the premise just a little bit because sometimes I worry that we try a little too hard to bridge the gap. Um, and so we have the prevalence in the media and um, in movies and veterans who are sharing their experiences. And I think rather than helping the gap, I think that actually exacerbates it and reminds people that there are really big differences in some cases. Um, or at least makes people think that there are bigger differences they, than there are. What, what kind of stories? Like, you mean, when, what kind of story makes someone think that the gaps are bigger? So, so uh, as an example, if, if I would go back to, um, you know, a, a town and talk to college students and talk about my two deployments to Iraq, there, there's a segment of that, of that group, and I've experienced this on a couple, uh, in a couple of circumstances, where they've come away and said, wow, I can't even imagine doing that. And they've taken it more as, I'm not bridging the gap, I'm making the gap bigger. And I'm showing them that there's a, more of a fundamental divide than there actually is. I think for me, the, the way you really solve this is through relationships and so, sort of long-term uh, long interactions with people. So you know, during my time in graduate school, during my time uh, at the White House and other places, I think when I've had relationships that didn't start with, let me tell you about my service, or with somebody asking me about my service, and you had a relationship develop over time that came out sort of organically, it had a much um, more positive impact on bridging the gap, uh, so to speak, than if I tried to tell people, hey, let me you know, talk to you in a way that helps bridge the gap and helps you understand. Oh, um, you, you mean they just needed to get to know you as opposed to yeah, some I, artificial way of let's all kumbaya together and get to understand yeah, each and other. So I think sometimes by, by trying to solve it, we actually make the problem look bigger than it really is if we just interact with people sort of um, in a more organic way. I, I think it's a really hard and interesting question to sort of figure out which problems are problems, which differences make a difference. Because um, I don't think all of them do, right? There are little problems and there are big problems. And, you know, is it, is it accurate to say that people often, civilians often fall back on one of two stereotypes about military personnel? 
which is they're either all you know Superman like heroes. Uh, I could never do what you do because you're such a you know superhero. Or, or they flip immediately into, you probably have PTSD, you're probably sexually harassing people, and you're probably about to go nuts and kill a bunch of people because of your PTSD, you know, and you're probably about to be homeless. You know, one of those two that we do tend to sort of flip back and forth. Um, but again, you know, so as I started out, you know, to be provocative, Americans have stereotypes about lots of people, right? We have stereotypes about reporters, we have stereotypes about lawyers, we, we tell mean jokes about lawyers and sharks. Um, it's, you know, the, and the question is which of these matters and when does it matter and how does it matter? And, and what I would suggest on the, on the sort of numbers question, the small percentage of the population who serves, for most of American history, we have a, had a tiny, highly professionalized military that has been quite separate from the rest of society, and we didn't think it was a problem, right? That the anomaly, we, we tend to hearken back to the World War II era as this sort of weird golden age of mass death. The meeting has ended because it had only one participant <laughs> for the last 30 minutes. I think we're and, getting pulled off the stage. And that's it, everybody. <laughs> now, you know, we, we hearken, this is so weird to me, by the way, right, that World War II era was a horrible era in a zillion ways, you know. Um, but we think of it as this kind of golden age of civil military. Like, oh, wasn't it great? You know, everybody was getting drafted and sent off to get killed. That was wonderful for everybody. And, and you know, it's true that the positive, the benefits were real in terms of demographic mixing, in terms of sort of creating a degree of social change that probably would not have come about or not nearly as quickly had it not been for the draft. Um, but that being said, that was an anomaly. To have that high a percentage of Americans in uniform was completely weird and anomalous relative to American history. For most of our history, that's not the way it was. So the question, I think the question that we have to ask, and, and I have some potential answers, but I'll, but I'll stop and see if my colleagues want to chime in. I think the question we have to ask is, when, when and why does it matter if, if, if it didn't bother us for most of American history that the military was tiny and professionalized and separate from the rest of society, if it bothers us now, are we right to be bothered now and for what reasons? Yeah, I would, I would push back a little bit in terms of, yes, every organization has stereotypes and we hate lawyers and we think academics are liberal. Um, not you, sorry. And the, but at the end of the day, <laughs> neither of those two groups or institutions possess the state's uh, power to execute violence. And so there is a fundamental question that does get back to a little bit of what uh, Fever and Cohen were talking about last time of let's not take for granted some of the civilian control of the military. Now to get back down into the, into the weeds of this, of this hero victim dichotomy, because it's clearly there, it's ingrained, uh, and nobody's quite figured out the answer yet in terms of how do you get past this. I would submit that we need to be concerned about it because what it has is it's bastardized decision making about an organization that is, yes, very small, but wields a tremendous portion of the federal budget and has a massive footprint, even though it's small, has a very massive footprint overseas and is shaping the world on a daily basis. And so my problem with the, particularly with the distance and with the hero victim dichotomy is that yes, you should respect the troops. They are doing really hard things on a daily basis, risking their lives. But it's somewhere, and I think the World War II example is great, what we lost from the World War II experience was the lack of hesitation among civilians to look a general in the eye and say, you are screwed up. And so some of the reputation of the military for sacrifice for service has been appropriated by the military senior ranks, and it's the most under-criticized institution we've got. And it is wasting billions of dollars to little result in two theaters. General? So I, I think um, it's, it's not a case of whether people, you know, uh, worship or are ambivalent to the military. Um, it's about whether or not you want to sustain your military. When you, when you actually peel back you know, this, this piece about how many people had parents that served or not, um, it's deeper than that. We, we did some surveys, uh, focus groups, um, um, when I was in recruiting, where we asked, um, and this was for DOD, they asked um, black families what they thought about their college-bound child joining the military, becoming an officer in the military. And they used some pretty stark language. They said they would react with fear, anger, and disgust. 
Then they asked Hispanic families what they thought about their, their college age uh, student joining the military, becoming an officer. And they said that they would see it as a, um, a distraction from an otherwise successful career path. And so um, the question is, and, and, it's a, and that's large numbers, um, and when you have college and you ask the college students um, or in that age group that I, that I mentioned what they thought about joining the military and whether or not they could see themselves in that future state, you know, 22% uh, of, uh, of males said that, yes, they look like me, and 16% of women said, yeah, that's somebody who looks like me. And so the question is, do, how important is your military? That's a part of this, too. <clears throat> And, and I think it's not just about whether or not they're worshipped or, or you're ambivalent to it, but it's also about sustaining a military that can do the things that our nation needs them to do. How does that feed into the numbers of what's available <coughs> year by year and what the military needs? Sure. So, um, so when the, the, the population that fits in that, that age group, 16, 17 to about 24, is about 20 million. Uh, people in the United States and of that there's about 11 million that would fit into the the quality in terms of academic you know taking the the uh, vocational uh, battery test and having the kinds of grades that would we would we would uh, recruit you of that it's only 4 million that are of uh, that quality and then also have the uh, the um, medical and moral uh, uh, ability to join you know you haven't uh, you know, killed somebody and didn't burglarize the local bank or that sort of thing. Plus, you know, you have the medical ability to serve. Of that, it's about 350,000 who would also be propensed, which is they are willing and would want, would consider, consider joining. So of, of those numbers, we have a requirement in the DOD of 250,000. So you can see it's a fairly tight, some, just some, somebody out at a barn somewhere who might fall into that propensed category. And so we don't have, what I'm saying is we don't have enough people that meet the quality and are propensed on a daily basis that we can rest on our laurels to sustain a military. So I'd like to open up to questions. And as people think about their question, um, I'll just ask one more <coughs> tough one while I have you on the spot. The other thing that a lot of people think of in terms of the military right now, one of the main headlines, is about sexual assault. Where do the latest numbers stand? How are you doing? So, you know, across the department, again, um, we're, we're not where we want to be. I think uh, we, we had a decrease um, when you look back in, in 2010 or so. Well, in fact, if you go back to the early 2000s, there was a joint task force that really discovered that... Uh, that we didn't have the um, right policies in place, we didn't have the right training, we didn't have the right resources, we didn't have the right accountability. And I think we've come some distance in, pl in terms of putting in place you know, response networks, but when it comes to the prevalence and how much this occurs, the last reports that just came out in the last couple of months, but both for the military service academies and for the active duty, uh, show that we're not going in the right direction, whether it's for the occurrence of sexual assault or the reporting of it. So prevalence, which we always like to say was going down, is not. And uh, in the Air Force, it was a slight number, but you know, I, I like to say we have about 2,400 sexual assaults in the Air Force, and um, and the reporting is not going up either, which you know is concerning. 25% of the folks that reported last year said they wouldn't report again. Um, we had, just as a side note, we had a panel. We brought some victims together, and and a couple of them said this. I thought it was pretty stark. I would rather be sexually assaulted again than than go through the process again. And so, so that's a challenge. And, and that's a challenge for civil military relations. So right here, sir, uh, do we have, we have a microphone headed your way? And could you please just briefly introduce yourself? Uh, Joe Collins, National Defense University. Um, two things about uh, best military advice. First off, it's connected with a person. It's the chairman's best military advice that goes into the national decision-making process. And the chairman, and we've done interviews with the last few, basically considers all the contextual factors, all of the military situational variables, and gives his best military's military advice. But it is the military advice from a person. It's, uh, so the first thing is connected to a person. Second thing is it's not magic. It's often wrong. Um, in the Iraq surge, the best military advice of the on-scene commander, 
the combatant commander for the region, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, backed up by all of the Joint Chiefs, was rejected by the President. He decided that a surge was in order. The surge worked. It reduced violence by 90 percent, uh, which I, I, I think was about as best as you could hope for uh, coming out of that one sort of thing. Joe, that's a, that's a good example. And, yeah. But, of course, President Bush's um, popularity rating really took a hit because he um, stood up to he, his military he did, commanders. He did, he did the right thing. So you're and it required, for him to do the right thing, it required a massive electoral defeat and the firing of the Secretary of Defense and the, uh, uh, and the pushing of the Vice President to the background. But he did it. So um, do you have a question for the panel? No, I, I, it was a comment. <laughs> Yes. It was a comment because uh, Jim on the end said, hey, you know, we shouldn't use the term best military advice. Uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, I think it's a term that's in the law. It's in the Goldwater-Nichols law. Anything to add to that? Actually, I don't actually think that's in Goldwater-Nichols. I think it came out in one of the recent NDA NDAAs as a change. Um, but, but, but that's a f fair point, and I can go back. Whether it's in the... Whether it's in the law or not, I, I think the point I want to emphasize is that this is a conversation and there needs to be more humility because we often are wrong. And it, from somebody who's sat in a number of uh, uh, principals committee meetings and deputies committee meetings and heard it from the White House's view, they don't usually view it as being tied to a person. Ma'am. Mary Beth Ulrich from Army War College, Carlisle, PA. Follow up to, I think it was Rosa's question about what should we be bothered, should we be bothered about these trends now and why with the general, I guess, civil mill gap issues. Two, two things that come to mind that I think has changed, that have changed, and it's been brought up a little bit today. Number one, the obligation to serve. The idea that, you know, of the common defense and an obligation of citizenship is to somehow be think that you are at least, um, you know, it's possible to be called upon in, in this, uh, this common obligation to serve, which there is survey data now showing that that is not widely reported or not widely, widely perceived and there's actually been a change. So I'm thinking in particular the, the Pew survey 2011, um, War on Sacrifice since 9-11, some of those questions were getting at this and um, you're saying like, for instance, you know, do you, do you think that it's the, the, who's bearing the burden of these wars? and they polled the veterans and civilian groups separately, and they both agreed, very high numbers, oh yes, the military's bearing the burden and the military families and all that. But then they said, well, the next question, do you think this is fair? And the um, civilian side just basically said, well, that's their job, of course it's fair. So, you know, this came up, if they want to do it, you know, fine. So I, so I think that's a change, and that is a basic obligation of citizenship, and we should be worried about that. So maybe there's only 1% who can serve, but maybe national service or something to increase this, this obligation to some type of national, um, you know, the, to the country somehow. And so, then the other trend which, which came up, um, uh, but we haven't talked about it much um, since then, is the rise of the military caste. So I think this is directly part of the civil mill gap issue. If we have a 1% that's serving, so 1% of the families or whatever are all in, that's all they know, and they all want to do it, they think this is great, you know, great. You know, great mission, yep. great satisfaction. So, great so you have benefits. Sparta. I see they you're saying what it. you're saying is how do you get civilians yeah. to who have not been part of this warrior caste yes. to get the sense of the need to serve? They're not and even I, thinking about it. That may be part of the, not even on the radar. You know, they so don't even think to about the panel. It. So mm -hmm. I guess this is this is why I push back against uh, kind of generic statements about oh the gap it's a problem. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, I think we need to not be sloppy in how we think and talk about it. I think we need to, to have real specificity in what parts of that are a problem for what reasons, because depending on what we think the problem is, there are actually rather different solutions. If we think the problem with the small number of Americans who serves is that, uh, the military has been a really powerful engine for social mobility and that military service gives access to certain high level 
uh, government jobs because of things like veterans' preference, then the fact that women serve less and that African Americans are less likely to serve, et cetera, is a problem because it will limit their access to social mobility in very real ways, and then we want to have one targeted set of solutions in terms of recruitment to the problem. That's what we think is the problem. If we think that the problem is that we want to inculcate more broadly amongst young Americans a, a sense of obligation and shared sacrifice, then the solution might be a return to conscription, even on a very limited, small-scale basis so that risk is distributed evenly. If we think that the problem is that lack of uh, familiarity with the military because people don't serve, don't have close relatives who serve, means that they lack critical knowledge that then enables them to ask questions that we believe are societally important, well, then there are, there's a different set of solutions to that as well. So, so, and maybe we think that they're all problems, right? And that, that's fair. I mean, and I would go so far as to say they are all problems. But I, but I do think that they're, they're quite different problems, you know, and you could solve the knowledge problem, as Charlie Dunlap suggested in the last panel, you know, there are ways to solve the knowledge problem that don't require lots more people serving in the military, if that's the problem. If the problem is the service problem, you could potentially solve that with some kind of national service campaign that also didn't involve serving in the military. If the problem is social mobility, there, there are two. You could actually solve these problems in a whole bunch of different ways, and unless we're really clear on what bothers us and why, I think we have trouble articulating exactly what we want to do about it. I think the key thing that I hear a lot is uneducated voters. If you don't know what your military does or you don't know what your State Department does or should do, it goes back to, to your book about that. Can you remind me of the title, Rose? It's the only book I didn't read out loud. Uh, the uh, title of the book is How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything. So to that point, if you don't know what all these different branches of government are supposed to do what their roles are and military becomes the thing that solves all the problems, that is what you take into the voting booth and who you vote for. And I, I think there is no silver bullet, right? So um, one of the things that we were challenged with in recruiting was just having the resources to recruit. In our budget in the Air Force was about $90 million and uh, we were funded at 20. And so when we talked with leaders and we said, how do you get to the dinner table with that family who act, act, you know, felt anger, fear, and disgust. How do you get to that dinner table for that discussion? And, but it's not just the marketing. It also, I think, requires some structural uh, changes, you know, like was brought up with a service, uh, you know, that, that kind of forces this uh, experience to some extent. And then uh, I think it's incumbent on the military to also do things, and we do some of those things. We get out in the community, we do honorary commanders. You know, I, I, when I was a squadron commander, I had uh, uh, the uh, director of operations at SeaTac Airport was my honorary, and he didn't have any military experience, but I made sure that all the events we did, I brought him and his family out to those, so you kind of get that. And so the military, I think, has a responsibility to get out there, too, where, wherever they can and, and, and do that, air shows and all those kinds of things that we do um, across the military. So I don't think there's a silver bullet, but I think it's incumbent on us to do it. Yeah, I do want to point out one thing, because I agree with Rosa's comment that um, the all-volunteer force is not the aberration. Um, you know, World War II, if anything, is the aberration. But I think there was an aberration from about 2003 to 2009, 2011, where we had an all-volunteer force during a period of costly, bloody wars where we mobilized the military but not the rest of the public. Um, and so I think sometimes we lose that in, in this discussion. Um, and I think that actually leads to three sort of specific problems that, that I saw. One is a breakdown in norms, which Jason talked to, uh, and over deference to the military and less skepticism. Some of the work that Peter Fever and I did and Corey Shockey and Secretary Mattis's book uh, laid out some of the evidence for this. But there, there has been a trend over the last 15 years toward more deference by the population. I think second is there has been uh, at least some sense of entitlement on the part of the military that we deserve more because we're the 1% who are serving and other people aren't. Um, I think you know, some of that is natural when the military mobilizes and bears the cost and the rest of society um, didn't mobilize in the way we had in previous wars. But I think some of it's a failure in leadership as well. Um, we emphasize that military service is unique and the only type of service. I think that was you know, good for small unit um, morale, but it probably helped to sort of bridge this idea and help build this idea of entitlement. Um, so we need to broaden our conception of service. And then the last one, I think it has had um, impacts on recruiting by driving uh, some of this into particular areas that will only s sort of reinforce itself. 
it is easier for us to recruit generally in the south. It's generally easier for us to recruit in rural areas. Um, I have evidence in a paper I did in Armed Forces Society that, that shows since uh, September 11th, uh, the number of Republicans who want to, or who identify as Republicans in high school have significantly increased their willingness to serve in the military world. world Democrats have stayed flat. Um, well, actually have, have decreased uh, at about the same way. So, um, so it has impacts, I think, in very concrete ways that we can tease out, but I would agree with Rosa that those are all different problems that we'd have to solve with different solutions. Then that brings up the question of, is it a civil <coughs> military gap or is it a Democrat military gap, a blue state military gap, because I, I, one of the things that I discovered, I got um, the honor to teach at the Army War College. It was really cool that they let a reporter be there for a year. Um, but some of the people that I taught, we were like aliens talking past each other because I had lived primarily on the coasts and they had lived primarily their whole career in army towns where the people they were around were supportive um, and largely politically conservative and understood their language and vice versa versus um, the world that I was walking in, uh, which was largely a bit alien to that unless I'm hanging out with Pentagon reporters where we've all been overseas with the military. Uh, on the one hand, I'd say, you know, the military gets what it pays for uh, in terms of recruiting. And again, it's, you know, it's this habit over time, and when I can guarantee that if an if a institution has given me five graduates for ROTC over the last 20 years, then yeah, I'm gonna keep putting money into that versus establishing a new outpost at Fordham. What I found at Columbia University in the aftermath of 9-11, um, it's funny, I used to do a little quiz with my students uh, while I was at West Point, and I would always wanna end the semester, well for one, at the beginning of the semester I would ask them, I'd say, as a much more clean cut infantryman, I would ask them, do you think I'm a Republican or a Democrat? Now he's a hippie. Yes. <laughs> I'd, I'd say, do you think I'm a Republican or Democrat? And overwhelmingly, they looked at me uh, as a white male guy in the combat arms of the United States Army, and they, the major, vast majority of them would say, he's a conservative, and he's a Republican. And then at the end of the semester, I'd always try my hardest over the course of the semester uh, to get something of an even answer. So I'd always ask them at the end of the finals, what do you think I am? And a lot, in a lot of ways, given those preconceptions, that required me to rave like Lenin for a good portion of the semester. <laughs> but one of the funniest moments I had was at the end of a end of an exam. A, a young officer, a young cadet, came up and I said, "So, what do you think I am?" She says, "Sure, you're 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 a Democrat." And I said, well, "Why? Why is that?" She said, "Well, you went to Columbia." <laughs> so, one, I don't know what the point of that is. Oh, then there's. <laughs> There's preconceptions and there's some, and it's, it's a really hard question about why are the senior ranks tend to be more conservative than Republican. But I think one of the interesting things about my research, some of the great stuff about Heidi Urban's recent research is, is that is not the case across the Army. The Army looks like America in terms of ideological uh, self-identification, liberal conservative, the military generally matches the public. Unfortunately, what you have masked in those overall numbers is you do have a large swath of very young, ethnically, racially diverse uh, soldiers uh, with an increasing proportion of women uh, who do look like the communities they come from, but then you also have a small upper caste that over time has congealed into kind of a conservative Republican worldview. There are some cracks in that. It's not uniform, and it's, it's let's just say that the given that there's at least eight of us in this room who've tried to figure out why that is, that uh, you know, it's, it's unclear is whether that's just a generational thing or something that we actively reinforce. Just, just to add one thing to that, just a footnote to, to Jason's comments and Jim's comments, um, you know, that these are all things that to some significant extent are within our control. Um, you know, these, that, that if we were to decide, I don't know that there's any particular reason we should decide, but if we were to decide, gee, we want the Office Corps and the military to, to ideologically reflect the ideological diversity of the nation, we could decide to make that a priority in recruiting. You know, that, that we, in, in all kinds of ways, and I think Jim was alluding to this, we make, we make decisions that, that turn into sort of self-fulfilling prophecies. We say, aha, you know, more of our recruits are from the South, so 
if I've got a limited recruiting budget, I'm going to go where I know the recruits are more likely to come and my dollar is going to be more effective rather than going off to Columbia and trying to recruit these, you know, hardcore hippies <laughs> like Jason, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, if we want to put the resources in and say it is an absolute priority for this nation that we recruit more Columbia students, I'm certain that in a decade we would be doing so. so and that's not to say that we should do that, right? I mean, that goes back to my question about which differences should we care about and which differences should we say, that's fine. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, but I think it is really important for us to keep in mind that these things don't just happen. You know, that they happen because of decisions about where to locate bases, where to close bases. They happen because of decisions about recruiting budgets and where we're going to put our recruiting dollars. They happen because of policy decisions that we make. And if we don't like the way it's working out, we can always change it. Yeah, and I, the point I was getting to was the, uh, the, the stereotypes about universities and about the military are largely fairly fragile if you just take the time to poke at them. Uh, and I said, in the aftermath of 9-11, everybody assumed that Columbia was this bastion of 1968 liberalism. I tell you today, right now, there are close to 500 veterans enrolled at Columbia University, more so than almost every other Ivy League combined because Columbia University in the aftermath of 9-11 said, this is a community that's important to us, and all they did was open a couple doors, and that the Ivy, rest of the Ivies are, are a little bit slow to get to, uh, and say, come on in. And I think recruiting command would find the same, but it certainly requires more than 20 million. It requires something closer to the 90 million budget. And that goes back to Major Golby's uh, point about relationships. We had two questions. Um, can I have a one after the other? Yeah. Uh, hi, Carrie Lee, U.S. Air War College. Um, the last two wars have seen kind of extraordinary wounded to kill ratios, um, traditional ratios being kind of three to one, and we're looking at numbers that are 10 or 12 to one now. Um, recent research has suggested that the public really internalizes the costs of KIAs, but not wounded in action uh, when determining support for military policies. Um, although people who know folks in the military or have members, uh, family members in the military do internalize um, wounded in action and expected numbers of wounded. What are the implications of kind of these extraordinary wounded to kill ratios and the ability um, to medevac folks out, um, but then, um, but you have a, a large portion of your veteran population that, that lives with disabilities. Um, what is this, and the gap in kind of the sensitivity to wounded between the public and military families? What are the implications of that for the military's relationship with the public? And what are the implications of that, do you think, for policy? And just one more question so we get through more. Oh, sure, Risa Brooks, um, Marquette University. Um, so I'm gonna take up Rosa's challenge, why does it matter? Um, asking about sort of, in particular, why does bl uh, sort of public blind reverence matter? And so all institutions have problems, right? The military, of course, has problems. Um, I can think of a couple of examples. Um, the one that's most glaring that I rarely hear talked about is this report that was done at Carlisle Barracks by two professors about ethical fading, which is really devastating if you read that. So how do you get change in an institution? It's very difficult to internally reform. That, you know, that must happen. I'm not an organizational theorist, but I think it's probably hard. So one way you do get reform is you get external attention, you get oversight, you get scrutiny. So who's supposed to do that? Congress is supposed to do that. Congress ain't gonna do it unless the public cares because they'll just be held up for criticizing the military. So you need the change in the public to get the scrutiny to get reform in an institution that's necessary. How do you get that scrutiny? I think that's really difficult. How do you tell, because one of the reasons you don't have that scrutiny is because of the social esteem of the military. So how do you tell an institution that it should be less esteemed? Especially in a poisonous political environment where the kind of scrutiny you might attract is not gonna be constructive. At the, so at the same what, time, I have uh, friends on the House and Senate um, Armed Services Committees who would really push back hard on what you just said, and the Appropriations Committees as well, including also on the military side, people who've had to testify before those committees and okay. consider it hell. So um, let's jump in. 
I'll jump in on real quick on the first one, which was the uh, wounded and, and killed in action. I think in general what we found was that a lot of Americans view it as um, broken, right? Whether you're killed or whether you're wounded in action, they see it as broken. They also uh, view things like how, how do we treat our veterans, um, not just uh, current serving but uh, post, post service uh, in terms of the VA, what's going on there. and so. Um, there are enough negative stories that a lot of young Americans are thinking twice about serving because they see it as, as um, potential to come back broken or uh, killed. You know, when they look at the top reasons to join the military, they can actually find those um, anywhere else, probably, right? Uh, what would you say the top education, reasons Education, okay. um, travel, um, you know, um, adventure, that kind of thing. The top reasons not to join are almost unique to the military, right? Wounded, killed, leave your friends, right? So, um, so that's a challenge that we have, and how do we, um, how do we again, market to the, to the American people that um, the other good qualities that, you're, that, you know, that the military service provides? So General, it's if a I could, challenge. If I could push back, where do you get the, the tribal sense that you get in the military, this, this family that goes with you and esprit de corps anywhere else but the military? So, so it is complicated. Um, there's a service called uh, Joint uh, Advertising Marketing Research Service, which looks at all the, what do, what do young people think about service as well as their, in, we call them influencers, their parents and, and educators and others who might have an impact on whether or not young Americans want to continue to serve their military. And, um, you know, as you would expect, when you ask them the question about what do you think about, which service do you think about for pride? They would, you know, be the Marines. What service do you think about high tech? Be the Air Force. And so, so these things are complicated. You can't shoebox any young American into why would they join or not join. But I would say, by and large, the challenge of whether they're broken or, or um, whether they're wounded, whether they're suffering from PTSD or whether they're killed in action, I think, in general, they see that as a large problem set together, not separately. Interesting. Um, did someone want to take a stab at the other question before? Uh, Risa asked the hard question, which none of us can answer. Um, uh, no, I think it's terrifically hard. How do you change institutions when, when so many of the surrounding institutions are, are, are at least somewhat broken themselves, uh, notably Congress in all kinds of ways? Um, you know, I think there's, to some degree, obviously, the services have some ability to make these changes on their own. Not, not every shift requires congressional action, obviously. Um, how likely is that given existing incentive structures and everything, even, you know, time in different jobs before people rotate on? You know, I think there are all kinds of structural barriers to really significant internal changes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to say more than that because I wish I knew the answer to your question, but I don't. Um, the only other thing, just going back to, to the earlier issue of when and why do these differences make a difference. You know, I, I do agree, actually, notwithstanding my, my earlier comments, um, uh, that the gap, broadly speaking, is a problem, that particularly at a moment when the, the role of the military in terms of the kinds and scope and scale of activities that the U.S. military is, is being asked to take on is expanding, that that's not a moment that we want to have the percentage of the American population that understands anything about the military contracting. And yet we've seen, we've seen those two trends going in parallel. Uh, and I do worry about, uh, you know, the, the, one of the issues that does worry me is, is, is precisely, yeah, where do, we get the, where do we get the smart people asking smart questions and raising hard questions about the military when we have that combination of, of uh, reverence and cluelessness in the general population? So one point I'd like to make before taking one last question about on the, the wounded piece. Um, I remember being in Afghanistan and having an officer explain to me, you know, one of the reasons they do these IEDs where it's, it's a pressure plate that um, takes six people to walk over it and then it just takes one limb off of one person is that they know that person is going to go back into the community, be hard to care for, and be a message to that whole community of this is what we did to your soldier. Um, so how sad it would be if we as a nation 
allow that to win by it keeping people from signing up because of what might happen to them. Um, sir. Uh, Midshipman Calvin Stever from the United States Naval Academy. Uh, my question is exactly on that point of that kind of um, myth, uh, the myth about the military and how, you know, the exceptionalism at the service academies we call ourselves the best and brightest, um, which is really presumptuous to assume that we're better and brighter than the other universities out there in the United States. But how do you take away or present a more realistic um, picture without degrading people's pride and joy of the services? So many Navy jokes, I'll pass up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. And we do want, we do want pride and service. And um, I, I think what's lost is this collective uh, engagement in the ideal of citizenship and it gets to you know, what is the problem we're trying to address. And unfortunately, we're trying to address this problem of a loss of a sense of citizenship across America by putting it on the military. Uh, and every discussion about citizenship goes to, to mass service uh, and back to the draft. And that was the thing that got it. I'm not sure it will, and I'm not sure that that's the silver bullet, uh, but clearly it's an issue, and I, I don't know how we address it, but I would say, and you know, to keeping to some of the other questions on accountability, um, it's tough because it does tie to the midshipman's question, um, do we care enough about Afghanistan to admit where we've fallen short and to ask hard questions? I don't think we're there yet. The only area where we're even close to the military being held accountable when we may ask hard questions is the issue that has failed decade after decade on, and that is sexual assault and sexual harassment. Uh, and we're still not there yet. We're still failing. We're still reluctant to fix. Uh, and so I think it'll be interesting to watch that dynamic and, and when finally do you have to stop trusting the generals who are giving you the same press release year after year after year after year. I don't know. I think part of the antidote, and, and you know, believe me, I, I teach at Georgetown Law Center and we tell our students that they're the best and the brightest too, and I'm certain that <laughs> I'm certain Jason tells his Columbia students that they are the best and the brightest, and it's, that's okay, right? I mean, everybody's, it's fine for everybody to go rah-rah, we're pretty awesome. Um, and you are, right? You're all awesome. Um, but, I, but I think, <laughs> and you get, gold star, right? But, but, but no, I, I actually do think that the antidote is for all of us, civilian and military alike, to remember that there are many forms of service that are absolutely vital to this country. Military service is one of them. It's incredibly important. And military personnel do bear particular sacrifices, not so much that they take risks. Lots of people take risks. You know, loggers take risks and fishermen take risks. But because you you say, I'll take risks and I, I know I can't change my mind. You know, that's, that's the responsibility that the rest of the nation has for service members is that, you know, you're literally entrusting us with your lives. You can't quit on a moment's notice if you decide you don't like it anymore. But that being said, the nation needs teachers, the nation needs doctors, the nation needs people who build roads, the nation needs all kinds of people. You know, and, and I think that reminding ourselves both within our civilian institutions and our military institutions all the time that it takes a whole lot of different kinds of service to keep a nation together and to make a nation a nation. Uh, you know, and that most of you at the Naval Academy will not end up spending the rest of your career in the military. Some of you will. Some of you will become the, the members of the Joint Staff of the future, but others of you will do five years and then you'll go do something else, and some of you will become teachers and doctors and so on. You know, and, and, and I think that sort of continuing to reinforce in all of our institutions that how incredibly important it is that we emphasize to all of our young people service matters. It's not how you do it, it's that you do it. And there are a lot of ways, that, and we haven't really talked about national service, but, but I think you know, it's been alluded to in some of the, the earlier discussions and, and uh, questions. Um, you know, I would actually love to see the US have, have universal national service, uh, including not just military, but a wide range of other activities from sort of Peace Corps-like things to AmeriCorps kinds of activities, uh, I think would be incredibly powerful not only in addressing some of the specific issues we've talked about today, but also in terms of some of the more broad, broader issues of political divisions in this country. 
I just want to say, and we ask you to kill justly and to possibly die in the process. And you're about the only job in the United States where we ask someone to do that. And that's extraordinary. So balancing that possible sacrifice and that job with everything else is something that the American public is still trying to understand and will, I think, every single generation. The question is, are we educating them? So I've warned you all that our last um, couple minutes are going to be spent in a, another lightning round of two minutes each. What's the solution? <laughs> Major. Thanks very much. It's been a, a great panel. Um, so I'll try to hit a few things. One will come directly off uh, the topic we just had. And I, I would say you should be extremely proud of your service and you should recognize that. And I agree with everything Rosa said, but we have to be able to praise military service in a way that's not exclusive or in a way that puts other people down. And we have to talk about um, the value of service more generally. And I think when we talk about the 1% or when we tell people like you that you're, you know, you're special because you signed up when others wouldn't and you know those punks at Harvard can't do it, that's not helpful because they're going to serve and do other great things. And we, as Rosa said, we need all those people. So I, I think that's the first point I'd say. We I could do without the hedge fund guys, though. <laughs> um, I think, too, we need to work uh, we need to work harder to recruit in the hardest areas. And this is not just a military problem. This, as Rosa pointed out earlier as well, this requires resources and commitment. Um, we need to, to try to make sure that we are representative of all of our society in sort of a more sustained way, in my view. Um, three, I think we need to get back to our norms of nonpartisanship. So we had this question about the Democrat military gap earlier. One thing to remember is the military has always been conservative ideologically. But we have surveys dating back to the 60s and the 70s that showed as late as 1976, uh, the military was a plurality nonpartisan, um, and only about 30% of the, sorry, this is an officer corps, uh, only about 30% identified as Republicans, only about 10% identified as Democrats, and I guess it was actually the majority, about 60% didn't identify with the party at all. Um, and I think going back to that idea that we serve the entire nation, regardless of party, regardless of whether they're rural or urban, regardless of whether you know, they're educated, uneducated, wealthy, or, or poor, um, get back to that idea that we are servants of the nation and the republic as a whole, and to reinforce those norms, because I think they're wearing down uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. I'm going to go with universal national service as my solution. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually think that whenever this issue comes up, people are way too quick to dismiss it. There's a sort of immediate, oh, well, yeah, that's not going to work, or, well, oh, yeah, that's too expensive. I don't think that's true. I don't think that we have been serious, and this, I think, was something that we had th talked about uh, spending more time on today, uh, and we didn't, but I'd love to see a, a whole conference on that. Um, you know, I think, I think there, too, we're a little too quick to just go, oh, not possible, and we're just not being imaginative enough. Uh, you know, I, I think that there, there are viable ways to fund a really expansive national service scheme and view it as a massive investment, both in infrastructure, education, et cetera, but also in, in rebuilding a sense of America and a sense of common identity. And I do think that that was the, you know, the one good thing from that World War II era was the role of military service in forging a much greater sense of common identity. I think we can overstate that, right? We still had plenty of issues, but but, but at least in, in really helping to create a sense of there's an America, whether you're from the South or from the North, whether you're black or white, et cetera, et cetera. And we certainly need something like that today. The, the, the other slightly sort of smaller point I, I would make um, uh, is that go, you know, going back to Reese's question, well, what can the services do without Congress, even if you assume Congress won't do anything, that there are all kinds of ways that the services could experiment more with temporary commissions, with lateral transfer possibilities for people uh, uh, to increase movement in and out of the military world and the civilian population. We've done it in the past, particularly during wartime. No inherent reason we can't do it again. Uh, similarly, to expand opportunities such as fellowship programs and uh, programs that fund people to go to civilian institutions for education and go back. You know, I think all of those things are, you know, they're smaller scale, but they all play a really important role in trying to ensure that sort of fluidity and common knowledge between military personnel and civilians. Oof. Yeah, boil the ocean. Um, this is what we're being asked to do here. I think, because I think it does, it comes down to this conception of citizenship. 
Uh, you know, the military has like a 76% approval rating, which is just ridiculous. Uh, a good third of that is just complete ignorance and sure, they've got it. Uh, you know, Bradley Cooper looked great in that movie, whatever. And so, you know, and, and it's actually unhealthy because again, it has not allowed us to dig into what structurally is the military doing? How is it manning itself? How is it choosing to recruit and retain people that are not an issue right now, but are gonna become an issue? And we do have a system, uh, you know, where this cohort effect, the way the military runs is very much a 1950s era industrial scale personnel system that makes very little sense, uh, not only for today's wars, uh, but makes very little sense for the way we're likely going to be fighting 10 to 15 years down the road. The inability to pick talent, uh, the imposition of a lowest common denominator system uh, that ensures we're all interchangeable widgets because we're fighting the Russians in the fold of the gap in big numbers. Uh, that's the system we still have. And this lack of public engagement to ask military leaders, this is what you say you're doing, but this is the system. And that, that for me, the most preposterous, you know, we're not in a personnel discussion, but the, the one indicator of the difference between the American public and the American military is the American public has been allowed to be an unexamined bureaucracy and operate as one, unaccountable to the people it serves. If you were to go uh, and pull out the evaluation reports of every battle space owner in Afghanistan over the last 10 years, just pick one district, pick one province, and lay those OERs side by side, and I guarantee you that they all got A plus marks and that all their evaluation reports tell a never ending tale of success. That's what a bureaucracy does. It has its own measures and outcomes, tells itself it's winning, uh, despite evidence to the contrary. Uh, and it's allowed to do so only when there is no external scrutiny. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with, one, the inflated indifference or the indifference we have that allows for this inflated sense of efficiency and proficiency. Uh, and some of that boils down to, again, the bigger question of uh, how do we convince citizens that you not only have a role, you have an obligation to be asking what the military is doing with your sons and daughters. Well, I'm going to pretty much agree with a lot of what's been said already. I think especially on a couple of the points that uh, Jason's made over the course of this that I think, um, you know, when I started out, I talked about the expectations that the American public has for our military, including, um, you know, a, a reputation for self selfless service, uh, unimpeachable integrity, and, of course, uh, um, the expertise in, in our specific uh, services. Um, the challenge, part of the challenge has been that um, I, I don't think people question our selfless service um, or necessarily the expertise, but sometimes the integrity piece is the piece that I think will really challenge us. And I think when he talked about the sexual assault, I think that is really indicative of where we really have challenges, being very transparent, uh, owning up to what the, what the problem really is. And quite frankly, um, I think that the American people want to know that we know what the problem is and then that we have some solutions for it, which is, quite frankly, in, in many ways, the way the military is really good when they're facing certain pro problem sets is that they can, they can distill a problem and then they can um, put forward uh, courses of action and, and make decisions and go forward. Um, but on some of these challenging issues like sexual assault, I think we've, uh, we haven't done as well as we could have done in terms of um, owning up to what is the real extent of this problem, and then what are, no kidding, some real solutions. And quite frankly, I think we face some of the same challenges society faces when we talk about sexual assault in both understanding what it really is and then actually having some solutions. And um, just, you know, what I found is even when you do have some solutions, um, not everyone wants to admit the extent of the problem. And I say this very often to senior leaders. I don't really believe we believe the problem is what we say it is. Otherwise, our actions would be different. Our investments would be different. Where you put your money, where you put your resources, where you put your time, that's what matters. So I think if, you know, if our nation wants to continue to have a sustain a military that reflects what they want it to reflect, then you've got to put the time in. And that means the military has to do certain things too. Um, so I think on both sides, we should be looking for structural solutions. So to sum up 
one of the overarching themes is the American public needs to be taught both how the military is incredible and fallible, what it's doing to stay accountable, and how they can be part of the mission. On that note, going to release you all for some coffee before coming back for Admiral Mullen. Thank you very much.